It'll say, oh, we've got four shards with zero and one with two. Migrate one of those two to another one. And then you've got two. And then you can kind of see how it works. Okay, so as more data is inserted, it's going to naturally yes. split into the right size partitions. Yes. Well, yeah, I would have thought you just would have started evil and spraying them across. You don't know the range, though, right? You don't know the range. You but know if it's a hash, you don't. That means that it's, it's, well, it's a hash, it's a hash, it's a hash, but the hash doesn't necessarily determine the shard. The hash determines where, which chunk range it's going to go to. So if you only have two values, then they're going to be in the same chunk. And then as you add more, then it's going to start. All right, so I guess I'm just doing really complicated with very large databases. Actually, we always work on language. I've worked for a lot, another large database company too, and, and when, when we said hash, it actually just meant like, you know, actually the random thing. But in this case, it's the hash of the chunks, so you have to get to that point where a chunk is bigger than 13 megabytes in order to split it to get to have multiple chunks yeah. to get that. Yeah, yeah. 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 we would just spray it across. Right. Still. Exactly. I, I really All right, I have a 16 megabyte question for you guys. Okay. One of your shards goes offline. Is there any replication between those shards that has data from other shards? So if you're in a large shard deployment like this, one of the one I think like we can go even shard replication. One of the nice things about Mongo, for example, is these guys right here, they're they're a single shard where there's writes that don't use the primary and replication going to the secondaries. These can all be in separate data centers. So the idea of over separate data centers, separate racks, etc. So the idea that you're gonna lose a shard is quite unlikely. In fact, if you're doing a multi-data set at the point, you're more likely to lose all your primaries or all your secondaries, in which case, actually, once again, separate Mongo is sort of self-healing and will make up for that. If you put, theoretically, if you lose a shard, Mongo's gonna tell you, okay, you have an infinite data set now. So what does it do? So because some companies don't have multi-data centers, they're in a one rack, two rack alignment, and it's possible that cage goes offline. God forbid it does, right? But now let's just say your primary, secondary, and secondary, that one storage unit goes offline, but you still have those other three. How does it rebalance that so you don't lose those key ranges that you've You won't lose off? the key ranges, but unless you do some manual interventions with the data, it's going to be Not good. But for the for, for purposes of querying, though, you'll just, you just won't get results back to that range. Is that correct? No, so that's the thing. We don't want to lie to you. We don't want to lie to you and basically say, like, oh, you're getting results, and no, you just have less than before. So that's why if we're going to lose a whole shard, that's not we're going to purposefully take the count rather than just say that and then just gone. So it's actually a design decision. Rather so the entire cluster of all the shards goes down when one shard goes down. Okay. Right, but keep in mind that you're not, this, this, you know, you could lose one, 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 but these shards aren't going to be on the same rack. If you lose a whole shard, you set it up wrong. Exactly. <laughs> right. <laughs> the, 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 like the whole high availability thing went out of the video. You're just setting it up, right? Exactly. One basket, so, all the eight. Yeah. <laughs> Which, and if, if you get this kind of just one like this, like we totally recommend you come talk to us. So, we can help you. Yeah. so this is similar to name mode and data node uh, in HDFS, right? Basically, name node breaks the data into chunks and then distribute the. Uh, so, uh, as far as like, HDFS, and I'm not certain about H base, I know H base does some kind of range based sharding. Yeah. We don't know if it does like the rebalancing. We got another one. Maybe it doesn't. Yeah, yeah, it does. It does. Okay, I don't. I don't want to speak too much to it. When you query a, a shard that's set up uh, across multiple data centers, uh -huh. Mongo does not yet know to query the local data center shards. So Mongo is in like downloading it tonight. No, but Mongo is like downloading it six weeks from now. It, it does. So that's a, yeah. that's a great point. In fact, uh, so question is. Uh, if you're querying through this Mongo S, let's just say let's just say we have a multi data center deployment here. We have data center one, where all the primaries are in data center two, with the secondaries data center three. If the query comes in and this guy here is in data center three, how does he know to talk to this guy for a relocality versus going across the network? So right now, I'm going to be today on the default build that you download. There's there's no way to do that. We do have actually a custom build that we deployed to a couple customers where uh, this right here will check latency to all these and you can specify a latency threshold saying only talk to Mongo asset or MongoDB servers of this latency threshold. But actually the fully supported way that's going to be the next version is data center tagging. So every MongoDB database, each instance of Mongo is going to have some set of tags. What data center is it on, what rack is on, etc. So you can then enforce, if you have 
is to keep on using the co-located with your app service. So if you have some sort of Mongo SS in one data center and another is in another center, you can force them to read you uh, locally, which is cool. And then actually, and like, if you're interested in this, come talk to me, you know, then we even do it with red locality where you specify the geo shard key. Uh, and so basically you can guarantee green locality <coughs> and right locality, but still have data centers replicated, you, have, you know, have a signature replication of all your data across all your data centers. So pretty cool in that you can survive whole data center failure and still never have any data. And so what's the next version that's coming out? It's 2.1? So yeah, okay, yeah, just talk about modern versions. So right now, uh, 2.04 is the most recent production ready build. If you guys are using Mongo, that's probably what you should be using. Um, 2.1 came out about three weeks ago. And the idea of 2.1 is that it gives a lot of the features that are in 2.2, but it's not recommended for production. Odd numbers, uh, 2.x, the x, the odd numbers are meant for development, even numbers are meant for production. So 2.2 will be out uh, hopefully next month. It could end up slipping a little bit, but we don't want to release a botched version. And the big features that are coming in the next version, by the way, are the uh, aggregation framework. So what that is right now is for aggregating data in MongoDB, the way you do it is with MapReduce queries. Uh, MapReduce is a really big hammer, big tool. You can do a lot of stuff with it. Most people are using it in MongoDB to do things like sifting group bind, or computing statistics, or averages, sums, max, mean, that kind of thing. Um, you can do that now with native MongoDB aggregation framework. And it's like an order of magnitude faster than the aggregate than MapReduce. So if you're doing that kind of stuff, that's a good thing. As well as the multi-data center deployment stuff, that's a big feature in 2.2. Improved concurrency is another big feature of 2.2. Um, really awesome multi-data center. Yeah, oh yeah, so uh, new JavaScript engine, we're moving to SpiderMonkey to V8. So it should make your MapReduce job even faster as well. Those are really the big features. I think there's one I'm missing, but those are kind of are there drivers are still a global, global write lock? There, there is still a, so yes, there can only be one writer per so per MongoDB process right now. So in the sharding configuration, you have four write locks, but there's still a global write lock. Um, but one of the things that we've improved in the most recent version <coughs> is the writers can yield the lock to each other. So the concurrency is improved there. And actually, um, our CTO and CEO, who are still the number one and two code contributors to the product, have really recently unearthed the code for that and they're digging in. So uh, I, I don't think the finer granular lock is going to make it to the next version, like 2.2, but I can tell you that a year from now there's definitely no such thing as being close to a global red lock and that can get really fine grained. How about the Hadoop driver? Uh, so, we, yeah, so we have a Hadoop connector which came out about a month ago and what the Hadoop connector allows you to do is those who are using Hadoop in 10 gens MongoDB world, we sort of consider that all of the things we need, like thousands of queries per second, real time access, that's a good fit for Mongo. If you're doing a large batch processing job, that's a good fit for Hadoop. So you can declare MongoDB as a Hadoop input, have your Hadoop go and grab data from Mongo, and then you can declare it as a Hadoop output that can then put that data back into Mongo so that you can query it in real time. But is it done through the HDFS rights or just directly to? Oh, say that again? So is this done through the HDFS import? It's That's not through HDFS, no. Okay. It's, just, it's just you can go and pull it directly. I see. So most people that are using uh, writing apps for um, that use Mongo, do they use the Java driver or something else? So, uh, for, uh, well, so everyone here pretty much sounds like time to use Mongo, but the way Mongo works, the way you talk to it, is with the language-specific driver. So people who are writing in Java, they use the Java driver. People who are writing in Ruby use the Ruby driver. Um, so pretty much you just use your language specific driver. Alright, well I will uh, let everyone go get another beer, but I'll be around if you guys have a fun time and ask me.